Sports. We are Black Hawk. We are the Lions. Today, it's our swan song from the desert, the final of our eight spring training telecast as the Cleveland Indians once again play host to their in-state rivals, the Cincinnati Reds here in Goodyear Ballpark. Hi again, everyone. Matt Underwood alongside Rick Manning. It has been a beautiful spring and once again a gorgeous afternoon here at the ballpark. Understand the weather not so great back home in Cleveland, but we've still got a little time before opening day. But for the Indians starting pitching, it's coming down to the wire, Rick, and there's still a lot to be decided in the last 10 days or so. And for Danny Salazar, this should be a big start this afternoon. Now, what Danny Salazar has to concentrate on is getting that fastball down in the strike zone. They want him to establish low and then work his breaking ball in after that. He's coming off a good start last week against the Colorado Rock. He's going to get another National League team here, the Cincinnati Reds. They just want to see him go out. He's much farther ahead this year than he was last year. Hopefully he can continue that and take it into the season if he makes the ball club. Salazar, of course, competing with guys like T.J. House with... Josh Tomlin with Zach McAllister and Terry Francona is watching very closely to see how each of these guys handles the competition as we go down the stretch. Also, Jason Kipnis is back in the starting lineup today. Brandon Moss will be swinging it to the play by play is next. Back here in Goodyear, Indians and the Reds getting ready for action this afternoon. And we'll take a look at Brian Price's starting nine for Cincinnati today. Speedster Billy Hamilton at the top of the lineup, followed by Joey Votto. Then Todd Frazier hits third. Brandon Phillips will bat cleanup, followed by Devin Mezzarocco. Then Brendan Bosch, Chris Dominguez, Christopher Negron, who we saw enough of last year to last us a while. And then Devonda Jesus Jr. will bat ninth. 
It'll be Danny Salazar on the mound, and it's getting to that time of the spring where you have to see results, command, strikes, get outs, and pitch for a job when you're looking at that number five starter, and that's exactly what he's going to have to do this afternoon, his fourth start this spring. For Salazar, as I said in the open, he's going to have to concentrate on keeping his fastball down in the zone, work that slider in, and hopefully he can work it with a little better tempo and get himself into the ball game quickly. Let's check out the defense behind Salazar this afternoon. It looks like this in the outfield. It'll be Michael Bielis in left. Michael Bourne in center. Brandon Moss over in right. Chisholm Hall at third. Ramirez at short. Kipnis gets the start back at second after getting a, about six days off. Santana is at first. And Gomes doing the catching. Marcus Patillo will call the borrows in strikes. Quinn Walkett and Ryan Blakeney will work the bases. Ready to go now as Billy Hamilton steps in for Cincinnati. This guy's got a boatload of batting gloves. He's wearing two to hit with. He's got his running gloves in his back pockets. Certainly a base stealer. And really that's the one question that remains. For Billy Hamilton there's no. There's no debating his speed his athletic ability. But can he get on base consistently enough to take advantage of that? So far this spring, he's hitting just 160, four out of 25. Does have a couple of stolen bases. Now, you don't worry about the stolen bases in spring training, but this guy, if they can do it on a consistent basis, he adds a different dimension to this Cincinnati club. Boy, he just creates havoc when he's, when he's aboard because he can steal second, he can steal third, and you have to pay attention to him. He had 56 stolen bases a year ago. But 117 strikeouts and an on base percentage of just 292. Swing and a miss. Salazar took a little something off and has his first strikeout to start the game. Well, let's go down to Andre Knott, who's standing by in the Indians dugout and like all of us watching Danny Salazar with great anticipation here today. We're watching Danny Salazar and Terry Francona made a great point this morning and talking about the fourth and fifth spots and talking about the pressure of these last two starts down here. He goes, look, they can't deal with the pressure here. How the heck can we put them out there against Detroit come when the season starts? Other thing to look at, Jason Kipnis back in the lineup after being out with a back injury. Michael Brantley out today as he has a tight back. If it was a regular season, most likely we'll be able to be in the lineup, guys. Yeah, that's a good point, Andre. And, you know, guys deal with ver a very variation of uh, maladies during spring training, most of which... If it was a regular season deal, they'd play through it. Nine times, uh, yes, there's no question. They can get through it. There's no need to rush them because this doesn't really count. Once we leave here, you forget about spring training. When the bell rings, boy, there's just a different vibe. And I think all these guys down here right now, Matt, they've been here long enough. They've been here about s almost six weeks. They're ready to go. You, that last week, you get ready for the bell to ring as a player. Joey Votto awaits the pitch. A little bit high. One ball, two strikes. Votto, tremendous on base percentage there, 390 even through an injury plague season. Swing and a miss, and Salazar has struck out the first two. Mickey Callaway's been very encouraged by the off speed pitches from Danny Salazar here lately in camp, and here's another good one. Well, you know, I thought this was a changeup, but now I, 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 you get to it. He, his slider and his changeup, they react sometimes very the same. Similar, yeah. they're, ver they're very similar. But uh, that one was a slider. I think the first one he got the strikeout was with a changeup that was up. And it, it all depends on his grip on, on how that ball moves. You know, I talked to Danny early in camp, and he showed me with his pitch grip exactly why we are many times fooled by the pitch because they're, they're not the traditional type grips that you're used to seeing when it comes to a changeup. Right. So a lot of times his changeup doesn't react like well, a normal change. And my place. guess is that sometimes the way he grips it, he'll overthrow it and it stays upstairs and it doesn't have the, the, the spin that it should have, like a circle change. Good fastball pegged the outside corner there. And it's two and one. The changeup is always a field pitch and, and the slider. He likes to throw it hard. If they want him throwing the ball downhill, concentrating down in the strike zone, and then the breaking stuff comes after that. That's mashed. Deep left and see it. And it was a fastball in his wheelhouse, and he has given up a home run in every start this year in spring training. And that has not changed. Two out homer. 
And a bad located fastball, I would think. Todd Frazier's third home run of the spring gives Cincinnati a one to nothing lead. And if you take a look at the location, they want it away. It creeps back down and in. Frazier jumps on. He's a good fastball hitter. Put a good swing on it. He got it down, but not the part of the plate he wanted it. And that will bring up Brandon Phillips. Well, hey, here's the thing. Every pitcher that goes out there wants to execute and you try to stay in the moment pitch to pitch, but you're going to make mistakes. You're not going to hit your location every time. But with Danny Salazar, the thing that Mickey Calloway and Terry Francona continue to stress is they're looking for that consistency. Right. And being able to repeat down and away down in the strike zone and time after time. And what we're seeing in this first inning. Great start. First two batters gets the strikeout. But just a little bit of inconsistency leads to a, a ball that ends up over the fence. Well, and now you're getting to that point in spring where we said now you have to locate. Now you have to prove. Now you have to get out. And they're looking for that. Down the right side, that's going to twist out of play. Yeah, there's a time in spring training where you work on things. You might have a bad outing as well. He was just working on some things. It wasn't really, you know, looking at pitch sequences and things like that. Now, with regards to these last few spots in the rotation, this is about competing. Yes, it is. Big curveball check, swinging a foul off toward the Indians dugout. And it's not putting any more pressure on yourself to go out and try and make a start to make this team. You just have to be yourself. That's that's what they look for. Well, and again, with Danny Salazar, I mean, can't imagine this is pressure. He started the first game, the only game of the playoff season two years ago. Swing and a miss. He strikes out Phillips. K's three in the first, but Todd Frazier tattoos one, and Cincinnati leads it one to nothing with the Indians coming to bat. The Indians will get their first at bat today against right hander Michael Lorenzen of Cincinnati. Born Kipnis and Murphy at the top of the lineup for Terry Francona today. Santana Moss and Gomes in the middle. Lonnie Chis Chisholm all swinging the bat well as we go down the stretch here in spring training. Mike Avila San Jose Ramirez rounded out. Michael Lorenzen on the mound for the Reds. This will be the fifth time out for him. Every time out, he's pitched two innings. His first start came against the Indians here back in. The opening uh, of spring training he went two innings, gave up three hits, struck out four, and walked one. Did not allow a run. And this is a young man they think has great stuff, and he could be a, a big part of their future. 
Made 24 starts at double A last year. With a 3.13 ERA. Two years ago he was the 38th overall pick in the draft. As Michael Bourne. Takes up high one and one. Lorenzen came out of college as a center fielder slash closer for Cal State Fullerton. Good program. There's a ground ball single from Michael Bourne into left field. Nice stroke. Well, he has had a terrific spring, and Terry Francona told me earlier today he does appear to be a man on a bit of a mission. Well, you know what I like, uh, what I've seen from Michael this year, when you try to pitch him in, he's been able to turn on the ball. You see that fastball away. He didn't reach for it. He waited for it nicely and just slapped it past the third baseman. He is hitting it where he's where it's pitched, and you can see by the numbers this spring, uh, he is feeling pretty good. Terry Francona said he can make our team so different with his speed at the top of the lineup. And he said, you know, I watch him every day. He's in that weight room. Working out and working hard, not going through the motions, but working hard for a veteran. Doesn't have a stolen base this spring, but he said that's more of a conscious decision on Bourne's part. He said he feels great. You know what? He still, you don't have to question Michael Bourne. If his legs are under him, like I said, you get ready to about the last week, and I'll bet you in the next few games, if not today, he'll feel like taking off and, and you know, just to get your footwork right. He, he's stolen so many bases that he doesn't have to. His legs feel good. You don't want to beat yourself up down here in the hard Arizona fields. And this guy's pretty quick to home plate, so you don't want to test it on a guy that's got it very quick to the plate. Kipnis slashes and fouled on the left side. It's nice to see Kipnis back in the lineup. Missed several games with. Back spasms played in the minor league uh, game yesterday and got his work in felt good today and you'll probably see him for a half a game. They don't want to push it, but he's Yeah, the back spasms. Uh, he passed it on to Michael Brantley. Kittness lines it into center field and Bourne will stop at second base. Hanging breaking ball. It was a low heater that went right past Lorenzo. You know, before Jason went out with the back issue, he was swinging it pretty good. And he looked like he was staying on the baseball where here's a high breaking ball. Easy for him to go right back up the middle with. And he does. So the Indians with back to back base hits here in the first. A couple of good swings. Now here's David Murphy. Murphy in the DH role today. And he takes a strike. High chopper towards third. Frazier feels it. He looked to second, but no play there. Take the sure out at first. It almost works like a sacrifice bunt. Second and third with one out. Let's check that Reds defense out. This afternoon, it'll be Dominguez in left field. Hamilton is in center. Bosch over in right. Frazier, who just made that play at first, he will be at third. DeGrone at short. DeJesus at second. Votto is at first. Mazzarocco behind the plate. Now here's Carlos Santana now with a runner at second and a runner at third and one out. These are the situations where the Indians want to see Santana maintain that selectivity that makes him such a good hitter instead he goes after the first pitch rips it foul and there's nothing wrong as you pointed no. out with going after that first pitch if it's if it's something that you're looking for Carlos is a, a great fastball hitter he loves to hit the fastball if you get that fastball first pitch and you can handle it get after that you have no problem with that and RBI guys will tell you sometimes that pitcher tries to get ahead of you and then go to work just be ready for the first pitch if it's not yours you don't have to swing. Sends a high fly ball to right field. Bosch backpedaling on to the front edge of the warning track. Bourne can tag and score easily. Kipnis tags and goes to third. The Indians tie the game on Santana's ninth run batted in on the spring. And there are two down here in the first. There you go. Job well done. And it didn't matter. It, this one might have been a changeup. Not quite sure because it looked like it was a little off the end of the bat. He had a good swing on it. But he gets the job done. He ties the game up. It's 1 1. 
And up comes Brandon Moss, who has a runner at third and two down. Moss with three homers this spring, five driven in, a couple of doubles and a triple. He looks like he is in tip top shape and ready to start the season. And that's good news because coming in, I don't think anybody was really sure where he would be at physically after having the offseason hip surgery. Bouncer to third base. Frazier has it. And the inning is over. Indians get one back to tie the game. We're even at one after one in Goodyear. One one our score second inning here in Goodyear. Another beautiful afternoon temperature supposed to get near 90 degrees before the day's all said and done. It has been. A terrific spring. Players have been able to come and go get their work done. Danny Salazar delivers low and away ball one. Devin Mezzarocco. Three out of 17 on the spring. Reds catcher along with Jan Gomes you get two of the best power hitting backstops in the game in this ball game this afternoon. Mezzarocco may have a little more pop than Gomes Gomes might be a better overall well, hitter. You know than what I, I, I would agree with that right now but Mezzarocco plays a little a friendlier ballpark to hit homers in. Down there, and I think Gomes uh, he'll be able to challenge him. Mesoraco had 25, and it's a great year. Drove in 80. I think Gomes could do the same thing. Caught the outside corner, well located that time for Salazar. Missed outside. See that time he made a perfect pitch the pitch before and you'll see this with a lot of young pitchers. He tried to do a little more and he, he overthrows that pitch and he, he missed the strike zone and he felt it. You could see him tell himself that. It's hit high in the air deep left field. Avila's back. He's running out of room and it is going to land beyond the bullpen. Second solo home run of the day for Cincinnati in as many innings. Mezzarocco with number two on the screen. When you have a fastball like Salazar, it doesn't matter how hard you throw it because hitters will catch up to it. But watch middle of the plate again. This one leaked back over the inside part of the plate. And it's a pretty straight fastball. But down in his wheelhouse and he gets under it and hits it deep. So this is the Cincinnati Ball Club. They can hit home runs and they have two already. The one thing though you see he's trying to be aggressive he's going at the hitters. 
Solo home runs. They're going to. If you give them up, that's fine. Just make sure nobody's on base. They'll let you know. The hitters will let you know when you make your mistake in the middle of the play. Foul right back to the screen. Running Bosch, left handed bat. Remember him with the Detroit Tigers? He could do some damage from time to time. Yeah, he's a good low ball hitter. He likes that ball down. He can rake it. Typical left handed hitter. I pop this, will go out of play. Broke his bat. It's in the hole and it's a base hit. Well, he broke a bat. He made a decent pitch and it found a hole. But let's take a look at Danny today in the first five hitters of this ball game. The outs he has that's a, a, a breaking ball, a slider right there. There's the fastball that got hit for a home run. He made a mistake. There's a breaking ball away. He gets Phillips. Then there's another fastball. That he leaves on the plate. This last one was a changeup that was down. Was not a bad pitch. He still got a base hit. But both balls that were hit really hard were middle of the plate. About the outside corner. There you go. There's nothing wrong with taking a little bit off your fastball and locating it right there. That's a. Most hitters will sit up there and look first pitch fastball, but if you put it in a good spot, they're not going to hit it. In the air to center field, Bourne cruising into the gap, calling for it. Makes the grab. Win, knocking it down. He had a beat on it the whole way as he looks over. At Brandon Moss. Well, you know, he probably could have let Moss take that ball in that situation, but as a center fielder, you're yeah, you're, you're the one that's taking charge, but the wind's blowing in. So it's pushing it away from Michael Bourne and it's pushing it to right field. Now he's got to deal with the sun. You stay with it, but once you get a beat on it, you can't take your eye off it here, as we said so many times out here in Arizona. Christopher Negron takes a called strike. Ball blew it right by him. But again, that fastball. Not primarily where the Indians want to see it. They want to see that more down around the knees. Anything that's thigh high or belt high, even with good velocity, A, it's either going to get hit or be fouled off. Oh, that one nailed him. Got away from him, and now there are two on with one out. Well, this is a slider that gets away from him. That I know was a slider. I mean, it's tough to tell sometimes. You know, as a pitcher, you would think that you should be able to separate or at least tell the difference between a slider and your changeup. But for, for whatever reason, it's hard for me to tell with Salazar on the mound. Yvonne De Jesus Jr. Fouls it right back to the screen. Oh. 
Yeah. Off speed pitch in for a strike. It's 0 and 2. Salazar checks the runners, deals, and it's lined to center. Bourne freezes in his tracks and makes the catch for out number two. Top of the order, Billy Hamilton, a strikeout victim his first time up. Hamilton rips it into right field over toward the line. Moss chasing it, cuts it off, but coming around third to score is Bosch. Stopping at third is Negron, and in the second with a two-out RBI double is Billy Hamilton. And the Reds lead is now three to one. Hamilton was not going to spot him the fastball. He gets that pitch down and uh, wasn't in enough as he raked it into right field. Moss cuts it off just making sure. Hey I've got to get that ball. With two outs man on first base you always go. Like he's going to come home with it. So it's a double for Hamilton. They come back, they have two, and they still have runners at second and third and two out. And now you have a tough out in Votto. Votto takes an off speed pitch. Looks like a slider down and in for a strike. Another one. Same location. Bono takes it again. Buzzed him with a fastball. Maybe just a show pitch to come back to set that well, slider yeah. up again. He threw two good ones, but you got to be careful because he just spit on that fastball. It was to take his eye or change the eye level. Line to center, a base hit on a one-two pitch. Negron scores, Hamilton scores as well. That's what I'm telling you. When you get a good hitter up there and you get ahead of him with the pitch you want to try and get him out with, sometimes you may have to knock him in off the plate or, you know, show that you'll go inside. He makes a bad pitch with an off speed pitch. That's his third one in this at bat out of the four pitches. And good hitters, you can't do that to him. With two outs, he just slaps it up the middle. It's a big four run inning. And right now Salazar is paying the price for staying in the middle of the plate. Well to go back to our storyline at the top of the telecast big start for Danny Salazar. Yesterday it was a big start for Josh Tomlin the day before that a big start for TJ House. These guys are all battling as we come down the stretch. Also Zach McAllister in the mix. It would appear at this moment in time that TJ House is a pretty good Lock to make the club is for one of those two spots, which would leave three guys for that final spot in the rotation. But there are also some variables, such as do the Indians need technically to have a five number five starter when the season begins? Can they manipulate the roster in other manners to to maybe make it a moot point? You know, a lot of things go into it with the off days in April and things like that, and how Tito wants to use his bullpen. Uh, it's interesting because uh, I think there uh, Andre is going to have Tito on he can talk to him about that too. What he wants to break with as far as relievers or starters go. Now Tito will tell you that he did break camp with as many relievers as they'll allow him. Well you know that.
You know, the, it comes down, as we mentioned, this last part of spring when you're a young player like a Salazar to execute, and he hasn't executed today. He's made a lot of mistakes on the plate. We're only in the second inning. Hit foul and out of play. Down of the dirt, nicely blocked by Jan Gomes. This is a changeup, I can tell. You, you can see how he turned it over a little bit. It was a changeup, but he made sure if he missed, he missed down. Runner goes, and a foul back toward the Indians' dugout. Near the on deck circle. Frazier has become a dynamite player for Cincinnati. Consistent guy that can be counted on. And with all the injuries they had a year ago, that's something that they're taken a lot more seriously now. Yeah, they have to get through this year healthy, as every team does, but they paid the price last year. Again, the runner is moving in Frazier, fouling it back. With a 3 2 count and two gone here in the second inning. A four run second for Cincinnati. Josh Tomlin, who got the start yesterday against the Diamondbacks over in Tempe, was banged around for nine hits in his four innings of work, only allowed two runs. Well, Salazar struck out the side in the first, but he did give up the home run. But in the second, everything's been hit hard. Starting with the solo home run by Mesoraco, a single. You had a line drive to, to center field by Bourne, a soft liner. Hit a guy, line drive to center, double single. Runner moving, swing and a miss. Frazier strikes out. Fourth K for Salazar, but four for Cincinnati here in the second. They lead it five to one.
Cincinnati leads at five to one as we go to the bottom half of the second inning. And before we do that, let's head down to the tribe dugout where Andre Knott is standing by. Thank you, Matt. Uh, Tito, uh, tough inning there for Danny Salazar. When you look at it, is it more of a consistency in the strike zone or with the off-speed pitches where he struggles? Oh man, it's probably a little bit of everything. I mean, he's you know you watch the first two hitters of the game where he struck him out, man, and then he leaves a fastball to Frazier, it hits for the home run. You know, they start the next inning and Mesoraco hits one. Okay, you know, but let's limit the damage. You know, and then it kind of spirals away. And, you know, we're still trying to figure out, you know, kind of what to say all the time because his stuff is is good. I think consistency is a huge word and, and, and intent on every pitch, not taking a pitch off, and these guys can make you pay for it. When you look at your roster right now, is there a chance that you could leave here maybe with four starters and maybe move this around in April, or is that something you haven't figured out yet? Now, there's certainly a lot of things to talk about because of April and the off days and, and knowing you're probably going to have some weather. But I think what we'd like to do is just make good, solid decisions. But we certainly have thought about different scenarios. One of the big news stories of the day is that Francisco Lindor was sit down with AAA. Not a surprise for you, but a big story back in Cleveland and back at home. Just some of your thoughts on what Francisco did this year, this well, spring. I, I thought he had a very good spring. Um, and I don't mean just, I don't know what his batting average was, but the way he carried himself, the way he conducted himself, uh, a, a year of growth, you know, maturity. Um, his future is really bright, but like young players, he needs to go play a little bit. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I mean, he had a really good camp, but if you picked your team on camps, you'd make a lot of mistakes. Absolutely. And obviously, Jose Ramirez will start at shortstop for you. Just talk about his spring and your thoughts on him. He's, he's uh, I think sometimes he gets a little bit overlooked. You know, he got to the big league so quick, and when he first came up, he was kind of, you know, he played a little third for us. He pinch ran. But he put up some pretty good numbers in AAA. He's just not real big, but he can hit, and he can hit from both sides. He can bunt, and, and he covers a lot of territory in the infield. So, again, I think we're in pretty good shape there. Last question I'll ask you so you can go enjoy the rest of the game and not be bothered by me. Has this camp gone the way Terry Francona has wanted it to go thus far? Well, more importantly is if, if it goes like Brad Mills wants it to go. Because Mill, everybody <laughs> has been around here knows Millsy spends a lot of time. When he gets here at 4 in the morning, and he goes... He leaves here sometimes at 7, and he, he's about as organized as you can be, and he allows me to kind of be around the players a little bit, sometimes goof around because he has everything so organized. Because if you're not organized, you might as well send the guys home, and I think knows he's the best. All right, well, enjoy your Wildcats tonight. Oh, yeah, I will. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Terry. Back up to you guys up in the booth. All right, thanks, Andre. And with regards to Jose Ramirez, not only has he done a great job, but he, he's got his own parking spot. Uh, yeah, right. We came here today and his car was parked on the infield of field one down at the player development complex. That was more of an inside joke that the players pulled a little prank on Ramirez where they got the keys to his car and parked it on the infield dirt. Yeah, he thinks he can park or drive wherever he wants and take any parking spot. They're well, showing him that he's still a rookie. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know what? You, you, you talk, and it was a good thing with, with Lindor and everything, and they say, you know, he's so young, he's, he's 21, and he has to play. That's absolutely right. But think about it. Ramirez is only 22. Mm -hmm. And then you have Martinez in here in camp that's really, you know, opened up some eyes for these guys. I'll tell you what, the middle of that infield looking pretty good down the road, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, exceptional talent when it comes to bat ability and glove ability as Lonnie Chisholm is robbed by Billy Hamilton, who has tremendous ability. Hamilton playing center field like Superman as he vaulted into the air to take extra bases away from Lonnie. That was closing speed right there. He gets and that ball slicing away from him and that wind is blowing it in so it's going to knock it to him a little bit but the closing speed by Hamilton that's something he can do in, in Cincinnati. He can go get him boy. It's exciting to watch a guy get a good jump and it was nothing but aggressive and thinking catching that baseball all the way. Good play takes a hit away from Chisholm. You know, last thought on Francisco Lindor. Terry Francona was very upfront with Lindor. He was he was very frank. He was very blunt with Lindor. You know, a lot of people have probably heaped a ton of praise on Francisco, rightfully so. But Terry Francona was quick to point out what he needs to work on, things that he hasn't done yet that he needs to do. And and I think every player wants honesty. They appreciate Bingo. honesty. They appreciate the fact that 
And Terry told him up front, look, you're going to start the year in the minor leagues. Terry Francona is a player's manager. He'll be honest with you, and he's not going to give you, and you mentioned it last week on our last game, I think, you know, any false praise that you don't deserve. And I'll tell you what, that's all you can ask for is honesty. You have to earn the job. Go out and fight for it. There's nothing wrong with spending and paying your dues. I think it was pretty interesting when Andre asked him about, you know, they are going to cover everything. I guarantee you they've talked about breaking camp with four starters and that extra bullpen guy because he can work his way through it where he won't burn guys out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? If anybody can do it, Frank Kona can. So I still think it's up in the air if they want to go with five. Uh, you know, it, it, who knows? Well, the other thing, and again, a lot of this comes down to, and we'll have Chris Antonetti on later in the game, not that he's going to give us any of the inside secrets but no, you can manipulate the roster you've got a guy like Zach McAllister who could be a starter he could be a reliever so yeah he gives you the flexibility maybe to maneuver the roster a couple of different ways Avila is thrown out two down Gomes in the scoring position but again these are these are very small issues in a six month season that yeah. we put a lot of focus on because it's opening day. That's all there is to really look at with the 10 yeah. days to go in the season. They're going to make the right decision. Believe me they're going to go in. They're going to close the doors. They're going to talk about it. They'll come what they feel is best for the Cleveland Indians organization to break camp with. It will change in the month of April. There's no doubt about it. It does every year. You know you come out and you never know if there's an injury or you. Something's going to happen sooner or later. Rick, all we have to do is look back to, wasn't it Terry Francona's first year as manager? They had a workout before opening day in Toronto. Uh -huh. And I think it was Scott Casimir got yeah. hurt during Stretching. the workout. Yeah, they, 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 were running, they weren't even running sprints. They were jogging sprints. Lotto calling for it, makes the grab, inning over. No runs ahead, a man left. Through two, it's 5-1 Cincinnati. Live Indians baseball is back in 2015 with MLB.com at bat on your smartphone or tablet. Stay connected with live radio broadcast stats, breaking news, and more. Download the MLB.com at bat, the number one app for live baseball. Brandon Phillips going to lead off the bottom of the third for Cincinnati. Struck out his first time up. Salazar with a first pitch strike. Tried to hold up, but he went around. It's 0 and 2. Yeah. 
One ball, two strikes. Phillips almost chased after it, but that time he's able to lay off and the count back to even a two and two. Wow, close pitch and a full count. Yeah, you could see he let a deep breath go out there thinking he had a strike, but let's see what he does when he comes back to this pitch. Get the out. Regain composure. Hard bouncer up the middle. Diving stop by Kipnis. Throws him out from his knees. What a play by Kipnis here in the third inning. Well, there you go. You want to test your back? That's going to test it right there. Beautiful play by Kip. Ranging to his right. Makes a backhanded stop. And I'll tell you what. He saves that leadoff man from getting on a board. And he helped out Salazar. Good play. All those defensive drills they do in the morning with you see Infield where his Coach glove came Mike on strap Sarbaugh really paying off handsomely for Kipnis. Sky high pop left center. Boy, you don't want to see those kind of plays during the day out here. Two down. Let's go back to the second inning that uh, Tito was talking about in the dugout. You try and minimize the damage. Made a good pitch to get ahead. 0-2. Couple of good breaking ball sliders. Then he goes upstairs, misses to change the eye level, but he comes back with a bad slider. And he gives up the two out base hit. You already showed that guy two sliders. Now, Jan Gomes could help him with a pitch, maybe go inside and help him right there. It's not, I'm not putting all the blame on Salazar, but uh, Vado's too good of a hitter. You can't make a mistake like that after showing him two to get ahead of him. That proved costly in that second inning as the Reds pounced on Salazar for four. Here's Jason Kipnis checking out his glove. Well, actually, blue. No, that's a, you know the, I told you the infields are hard. You can see the blood yeah. he's got there on the from the dive. Missed inside. Well, he ought to be used to that to some degree. Played collegiately at Arizona State. Down the road from here in Goodyear over in Tempe. No, oh, that's fine. You make the play. If he did make the play, he'd be a little disturbed. Buddied but unbowed. Three balls and a strike to count for Bosch. And that one got a piece of Gomes on the foul right back at him. This is another thing you look for in a young pitcher when you fall behind in the count and you have to go at hitters what you can go at them with. I know he's got the great fastball but do you go off speed do you challenge him. And can you execute that 3 1 fastball because that's what hitters are going to look for off Salazar when they get ahead in the count. Sliced out of foot. Then a three ball, two strike count for Bosch. See where he goes on with this three two. Fastball See, way fouled off. Remember, you were talking the first inning. A lot of fastballs up. They foul off a lot of pitches. They make you work that much harder. That fastball that's down in the zone around the knees is a tough one to even get a piece of. Oh, well, you have to work your legs to get down and hit a ball like that. That's what makes it so hard to hit. 3 2. Chased one up high. Strikes him out to end the inning. Five K's for Salazar gets a little help from the D here in inning number three. Jason Kipnis throws out a runner.
Five one Cincinnati as we go to the bottom of the third down of the dugout Andre not standing by we talked a lot about the battle for the final two spots in the starting rotation and he's got one of the participants. Yes I do Zach McAllister's here with us we've talked a lot about the fourth and fifth role in the rotation and we know you're going to be on the team. Where do you want to be come the, when this season this team breaks this day from here? You know, I like to be a starter. I think I uh, came in the spring training as a starter, and uh, I'm looking forward to if that works out. That's a, that's going to be great. I'm looking forward to that. But if not, I'm ready to be in the bullpen and do whatever I can to help. Last year you had to go to Columbus, come back and forth, and then you go to the bullpen, and it seemed like you really took off from there. What happened in the bullpen that maybe you can use going forward in 2015? I think actually some of it was in August when I got sent down, just really focusing on uh, – get my mechanics right and really pitching down in the zone and uh, executing that and I think going to the bullpen just kind of allowed me to realize that you know I can just trust everything and let everything go with max effort like just how I like to pitch and a uh, know that the ball is going to be there and that's something that I think I was able to accomplish out of the bullpen and carry forward. When you talk about that you talk about pitching and using your off-speed pitches is it something when you go down to triple A you can work on things that maybe helps you when you get to the big leagues and just believing in it? Yeah, I think so. I think it puts you in situations where you know you have to throw certain pitches in certain situations and uh, be able to execute those pitches. So when you do get back to the big leagues and uh, you have that confidence that you're going to be able to throw those pitches in those situations. Well, good luck, and hopefully uh, you're where you want to be when this team breaks here from Mayor's Zone. Thank you. I appreciate that. No problem, Matt. 14 innings, 15 strikeouts through the spring for Zach McAllister. Hey, Andre, how refreshing is it? You asked the guy a question, he gave you a straight-up answer instead of giving you that whole, well, I don't <laughs> care, what, whatever, wherever I'm at, I'm, it's going to be fine. Honestly, it's really a nice thing, especially when you're getting seeds thrown at you and everything else. <laughs> I think that's oh, why is that was, already starting down just, there? Just a little bit. Wow. I think that's why I wanted to be honest, so you can get the heck out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> I like it, though. I mean, hey, I want to be a starter. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. What he said there, when you go down to AAA and you work on your off-speed stuff, you have to be committed and make that breaking ball pitch at the big league level before you succeed. Boy, Michael Bourne just plugs the gap deep left center. One hops the fence up and over for a ground rule double. You know what I loved uh, what Bourne did there? You remember the last time we televised, he tried to bunt the first couple times up. He was working on his game. He tried to do it a couple of times, got the count in his favor, and ended up working it and then gets a pitch to his liking and drives it the other way. This is a great sign for Michael Bourne right there. Base hit to left field the first time up. He tried to bunt a couple times, didn't get a pitch he liked. Doubles to left center field. Both times leading off an inning. Led to a run on the first. He's in scoring position already for Kipnis, who singled his first time up. Look how quick the trainers react to. Remember, he opened up and looked like a gash on his forearm. They've already got him bandaged up, and he's ready to go. Bounced it right at Frazier, who was playing well off the line, trying to take the hole away from Kipnis, and Votto makes a nice play on the other end to secure the out. One away. Sure did. He looked the runner back and then sort of eased up on the throw and Votto had to come off the bag and, and then apply the tag to Kipnis and he does. I'm not sure he ever tagged him on that. Did you notice on the replay it looked like he might have whiffed. Here's David Murphy who grounded the third his first time up. So this is, is it interesting that it's not a true shift but Frazier's a good 20 feet off the line. Take another look. Does he ever well, you, see, tag him you know what? It, it's hard to tell if he tagged, but with only three umpires, you yeah. got the first base up sitting between first and second, so he assumed the tag was, was there. When you go up high, it was hard to tell, but it was close enough for me. He's off the bag plenty of time. He no. never tagged him. No, he didn't. That's why Kipnis looked at him funny. But you see, normally, regular season, uh, first base umpire's there. You're right. There was daylight. Bouncer towards second. And they'll throw him out two down. Born over to third. In any event, last two hitters, though, maybe it's because with Kipnis and Murphy, they're not true pole hitters. They're guys that will use the other side of the field. And so instead of flopping the shortstop over to the right side, they uh -huh. kept him on the left side and just pulled Frazier off the line. It worked out well to their I, advantage. Yeah, that's the, I like that strategy because they are not pole hitters by any means. Now with Santana, a little bit of a different look. 
Still not a drastic shift, but they do take the second baseman. Well, this way is where around. they should have the shift on with this guy because he is a, a dead well, pole hitter. And they just did move Negron from shortstop over to the second base side of the bag. Maybe he didn't get the signal from the dugout yeah. initially. Either that or they wait till he gets one strike on. But he's going to try and pull everything. Pops it high in the air to left. Dominguez makes the ground. No runs to hit a man left through three. It's the Reds five, the Indians one. Opening night for the tribe is Monday, April 6th in Houston against the Astros. We'll kick off the season with a special one hour edition of Indians Live at 6. Then we'll bring you every pitch starting at 7 right here on Sports Time Ohio. All right, that'll be opening day on the road in Houston. They have some new additions to that ball club. Added a couple. Big keys in their bullpen where they struggled last year. Some good young talent. Jose Altuve, of course, to hit dynamite leaders. second baseman. Yeah. When we were there last year, we didn't have an opportunity to see Springer play. A great, good young right. player that had so much power. What he had 20 home runs in his 50 some games that he played last year. Um, they've got some decent young players. Expecting big things from them this year. Yeah, Springer had 20 homers in 78 games last year and 114 strikeouts. I think the other guy they're banking on is John Singleton, who really struggled last year. But they gave him a big contract, a lot of dough to be an impact bat in the middle of the lineup. Yeah, I, I think he was his own worst enemy. He's hit in the right field and Dominguez singles to lead off the fourth inning. Sixth hit allowed by Salazar. Let's take a look at what Houston has done in the offseason. Okay, Colby Rasmus, who was with the Blue Jays. Jed Lowry, of course, he played short for Oakland last year. <laughs> Luis Valbuena, none other. Wow. Evan Gaddis had some wrist problems. Yeah, the this, big guy. This spring. And then they went into the bullpen with Nishak, who was with the Cardinals. Gregerson, of course, with Oakland. And Straley as well. 
So they tried to strengthen that bullpen because they blew more saves than I think anybody and lost more games from the seventh inning on than anybody did last year. Ripped down the line, foul, not by much. Well, I believe the trade that was Dexter Fowler went to the Cubs and right. Valbuena it was a part of it, yes. Part of that trade that uh -huh. came over from Chicago. Dan Straley was also part of that deal. Netted the Astros some help. But it's three games against Houston, and then the Indians come home for Detroit. So the season will start with a bang. They'll be right in the Central Division for a lot of baseball early. We were watching Detroit before our game began today, and they were up to their old tricks. Playing long ball down in Lakeland, Florida. Miguel Cabrera going deep. Cespedes. Joanna Cespedes, who came over in Boston in an offseason. Oh, we'll get to see him 19 times this year, baby. It's going to be a good run. Danny Salazar here in the fourth inning. This is up and away. He just hasn't commanded his fastball consistently today. I mean, you make a good pitch, and then uh, the next thing you know, you can't hit it. He's been very inconsistent. I think there's a reason why we've heard that sentiment echoed by Terry Francona, by Mickey Callaway. Salazar, what are you looking for? Consistency down in the strike zone right. with his fastball. You know, I don't know whether it's mechanically or, or what, but um, it's just it's just not there. I almost wonder if sometimes is it as difficult is it for, as it is for a hitter to go down and use his lower half to get a low fastball? Is it equally difficult for a pitcher to go down and drive it down it, in the strike it's, zone? It's sometimes it, it's hard. Yes, you know you got to use your legs to get down there and drive through the baseball to keep it down. The toughest pitch that is the uh, you know the glove side fastball for him would be low and away. Mm -hmm. You got to really get down there and. and but well, where's he missed out today? Front and go. Instead of down and away, it went down and over it, the middle it, of the it plate. It works itself back over the plate. You've got to really consciously make an effort to do that. You've got to work those legs in your back to reach out and get down there and make sure you get it there. And you think to yourself, well, why in the world? Could a guy that gets this far deep in the developmental stages of his career not have that mastered? Well, you think in the minor leagues, well, guys can't go down, or if you miss, if you're not hitting the spot you want to, you can still get away with it maybe in the minor leagues. Whereas up here, you don't get away with it. Well, we talked to Zach McAllister right there. Look at he's been around a long time and he's had a chance, but he still is inconsistent as far as throwing that. Off speed pitches for strikes when he goes in. He's working on it really hard. But, you know, here's a guy, McAllister's 27 years old. You know, and he's doesn't have it uh, down yet. Where you have to have your confidence. You got to be convinced. I mean, it takes a while for some guys, uh, some longer than others. Some guys can go out there and do it. They have a feel. They're not afraid. But when you get to the big leagues and you have to work on your off speed pitches at this level, hitters make you pay. Second batter that Salazar has hit today. And the same guy he's hit twice. And the inconsistency abounds. Negron was plunked in the second with a slider that got away. That looked like a fastball. He's hit the same guy twice today, but uh, they're going to start somebody throwing out in the bullpen. Might be Mark Zipchinski. Has not been a good afternoon for Salazar. Mark Zipchinski starting to get loose. You know, and for it could be for whatever reason, maybe Salazar is just a slow starter. You were, you know where he was mm -hmm. at this point last year in the spring, and it takes him a while for whatever reason. But they said he's been he was here early. He's been here since mid January working to get himself into shape. But last year it seemed like the Indians were just taking their time maybe 
nursing him through whether he had any issues in his shoulder or whatever. I remember they were talking about arm issues. And how often have we seen a guy go out and dominate in March and then blow up in April and vice versa? I think we've talked about a lot this spring that we've seen from so many of the Indians pitchers, whether it be Carrasco, TJ House, or, or Clover, they get the ball, they get in their rhythm, they work quickly. You can see now that Salazar, he's slowing down. He gets out of a rhythm, and it makes it tougher for himself. You know, no matter, and that's something they preach to him. Let's go. Mickey Calloway believes in that. And you can guarantee he's he's heard it as much as any other pitcher has heard it on this team, but it's a matter of doing it. I don't know if he has to think out there before he throws. To me, the less you think, the better off you are. Trust your catcher, throw what he calls, and execute your pitch. Sounds easy. Well, he's just it's at not. 81 pitches, so I would think he is. He's at 81. It's only the fourth inning. That's probably about done. This is what happens to him during the year. You get into the fourth and fifth inning and you're around your pitch limit. Swing and a miss. Salazar gets the strikeout and that's going to be it for him. He has strike uh, strikes out a half dozen on the day, but only lasts three and a third innings. Sort of reminds me of that start he had against the Chicago White Sox where he struck out was it nine. Nine guys in three innings. Yeah. Or three and a third innings. But he he, he was at that pitch count and had to leave the ball game. Here's another one. What's going on, bud? So six walks or six strikeouts, no walks, two hit batters. Salazar exits. Zipchinski enters when we come back. Five one Cincinnati. Mark Zipchinski comes on here in the fourth inning with two on and one out. And he'll be facing Billy Hamilton, who's doubled in a run and scored himself thus far. Zipchinski trying to put together another outstanding season in the Indians bullpen. He was Mr. Reliable a year ago. Interesting. Side note about Zipchinski's season last year is how often he would come into games where he would face literally just one batter. And I mean, I, I still think that's one of the toughest things to do. Yes. In the game where you come in and, and you know you're coming in to face that one lefty. Last year, you're a hired gun. Lefty relievers facing one batter. Zipchinski did it 23 times. Josh Edgen of the Mets and Randy Choate of St. Louis also did it 23 times. Well, There's the key, a you've got to retire the guys you face. 
Moss comes up, throws towards home, over the cutoff man, on the fly to Gomes, but the runner, Dominguez, had held at third, so the bases are loaded with one out. Well, Hamilton taking it the other way with a good stroke. This pitch you're going to see is elevated. It makes it a little bit easier for the speedster to take it that way. But he does it nicely. Up out over the plate. Doesn't try to pull it. Slaps it in the hole. And the Reds have something rolling again. Of the 23 times that Zipchinski came into a game last year to face just one batter, he only gave up three hits to those 23 hitters and one walk. Five strikeouts. Well, that's why Tito keeps bringing him back, yeah. you know, because he does his job. You get that man you're called upon to get. That didn't hit the batter, and it goes to the backstop, and a run will score. Cincinnati goes up six to one as Dominguez scores. Wild pitch. You see he crossed up here, maybe? Yeah, well, he went way inside. And well, there you go. It looks like, and usually for a fastball, if Gomes calls it, he was maybe expecting that pitch away and got it in, but it didn't look like that it was that far off the dish. Yeah, they had a little conversation. It almost looked like could have been. He was fooled. Very well could have been. So the infield in with runners at second and third and one out for Joey Votto. Missed inside. Also on the list of left handers who faced only one batter on multiple occasions last year was Scott Downs, who did it 17 times, and he's been in camp all spring long with the Indians. Bounced up the middle, backhanded by Kipnis. He looks on, but no play there. And he'll take the out at first two down another run in as Votto gets his third RBI of the afternoon. And that will effectively close the books. Yes. On Danny Salazar who's charged with seven runs this afternoon. Now that wild pitch hurt because everybody moves up they scored and then they take the double play away. You know, I brought up Scott Downs because he's been in camp with the Indians and he's still as Terry Francona told us trying to figure out what he wants to do if he's going to maybe stay in camp or maybe look around or maybe call it a career who knows he's had yeah. a heck of a long run. Yes he has you know and that's what you do you give the veterans time I'm sure when he comes to camp with under the understanding that hey look if I don't make your club will you give me an out or, mm -hmm. you know you have until a certain time you either tell me I can stay or I can work my uh, another deal out. So he may take a few days to see but then when you're at the end of the line you got to pick and choose and I'm sure a lot of it has to do with uh, your family. Slowly tap back toward the mound. Gomes calls for it and rifles it to first to retire Frazier and the inning is over. Two more for Cincinnati. They lead it seven to one.
Key Bank Kids tickets start at just $10 for kids 12 and under with the purchase of an adult ticket. Kids uh, tickets are located in the new family deck at Progressive Field, home to the expanded Kids Clubhouse. Just log on to Indians.com Kids tickets today. Pitching change now for Los Angeles. Or for, for uh, Cincinnati. Paul Mahomes last pitched with Los Angeles. And with the Dodgers made eight starts a year ago in his 30 appearances. Michael Lorenzen in his first start of the spring went three innings and gave up one run on four hits. Brandon Moss bounced to third his only time up. You see the infield shift for him where you have three on the right side. I think we'll see that a lot this year with Santana and also Moss at the plate. A couple of left handers that like that ball down and in they like to pull it. Tight into the strike. The second baseman who was playing out on the grass went away. Well, earlier today, the Indians officially sent CC Lee down to AAA. Also reassigned Francisco Lindor, among others, to minor league camp. Audrey Siriaco, or Audi Siriaco, had a pretty good camp. Destin Hood, likewise, was very impressive when we were able to see him in the outfield. It was a lot of fun watching some of these younger guys yeah. play in spring yeah. training. You know, that we don't get an opportunity to see. You hear their names, and you talk to people that manage them or coach them down in the minor leagues, or we talk to the front office, whether it's Ross or Chris or anybody, and they, you know, they give you updates, but you can't, you know, put it to your mind because you don't get to see them play at all. But there was a couple of young guys that uh, I think had some pretty good springs, and it's fun to watch. I didn't get to see him but one game. Brad Zimmer, their number one pick from last year. I really like that kid with the way he looked. He looked like he had a really good idea on how to play the game of baseball at a young age. Yeah, we got to see Clint Frazier, Bobby uh -huh. Bradley. Right. Those two were first and third picks, Zimmer and Bradley, last year, and then Frazier was the number one, what, two years ago? Swung it inside to Jan Gomes, who singled his only time up. Eric Gonzalez was uh, impressive when we had a chance to see him. Another young middle infielder, Giovanni Urshela. Strike call just did catch the outside corner. Not that Jan Gomes was in agreement. And a 3 2 pitch is up high, ball four. One on, one out. And up comes Lonnie Chisnell. Both teams into the bullpen early here today. Reminded me of uh, something. That I saw in the offseason. Ken Rosenthal, when he was on MLB Network during the offseason, pointed out this is a great number that in 1974, the average number of relief pitchers used in a big league ball game was fewer than three. Yeah. In this past year, it was six. Now, that's an incredible jump, but that's over 40 years. So I'm not so sure that. It goes to show you how the games change as far as specialty goes. It went from a, a conscious starter. You look for starters, but they have to pay so much for them nowadays where you have specialty guys. Just what you were talking about with Zipchinski of coming on to face one guy, one hitter, get one out, and you can make a living. Before, if you came out of the bullpen in the 70s, that's because you couldn't start and they had to use you. We, we needed 10 pitchers or nine pitchers. Now they have 12. 
sometimes 13 we've carried. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, the specialty of the game. Now your starter, if you can get through six good innings, you play matchup now, you've got so many guys. How many times have we talked about bullpen guys being able to throw 95 or, or, or thereabouts? Or Most above. of them do. Yeah. I mean, it seems like every team has them. They weren't around like that before. Line is short for the out. Two down. So I think that has a lot to do with it. They didn't trust the relievers before to go out and get outs when you had to get the big outs. Well, and not to turn this into a money thing, but I'm thinking even 30 years ago, we don't have to go all the way back to 1974. If you wanted the money as a pitcher, you had to be one of the five in the rotation. Yeah. You weren't no going to make a lot of money as a reliever unless maybe you were a, a high profile closer in the early days. Well, I, I, I think a good starter. Wait, wait, let's look at Jim Palmer when he played, or, or you know somebody like that. You go back and the, the the pitching staffs Baltimore had. Those guys, I mean, they never made big money, but they were solid pitchers for years, year in, year out. To, nowadays, the starters, if you're a good starter and you've proven yourself, it's twenty million dollars a year. Yeah. But even nowadays, as a relief pitcher, maybe you don't have the stuff to go seven innings. But you've got the stuff to get the lineup once or twice here and there. Four Six million hours. a year is nothing to sneeze at. <laughs> and that's what those guys. I'm sneezing. <laughs> <laughs> I want the 20. <laughs> now it's it, it that, that has changed. You know you could sit down and talk about it. It's just the way the game has changed like that. You know, nowadays you're getting back to where you, you have utility men and they're very valuable a team. If you can play two or three or four different positions and you're good at it because you can carry an extra pitcher or two. Force at second ends the inning. Four complete. 7-1 Cincinnati. Seven one Cincinnati as we go to the fifth inning Scott Atchison will be the third Indians pitcher to work here this afternoon. Let's send it down to the Indians dugout or Andre not standing by with Sandy Alomar. Hey, Sandy I uh, was sit here as we move into this inning. Can you talk a little bit about the development of Jan Gomes and just have you been surprised how quickly he's taken into the position. Well he's a he's been a very hard worker and uh, he's taken to to heart uh, the craft and uh, since last year, you know, he came to spring training. He came ready to work, and uh, he's done a great job. You talk about the relationship as a catcher that you have to have with starting pitchers and, and all the different personalities you have to deal with. It seems like that's something he took off with last year. We have to be kind of like a jockey. You know, you have to ca take care of those horses, and <laughs> he's done a great job uh, getting familiar with all the pitchers. He really cares, and 
Bottom line is that uh, he knows each pitcher in and out, and uh, he, he goes out there and executes. Were you surprised how quickly he took to the position? Because when he came over here from Toronto, it was kind of like we were talking about his bat, we weren't talking about him defensively, and it seems like he took off last season. Well, actually, after watching work for a week, uh, it's not surprising because he really is, you know, very serious about his work, comes in uh, looking forward to, to get better every day. As you go through the spring, there's more than just Jan Gomes you have to work with. Obviously, you got to get every guy ready no matter how much they're going to play. How difficult is that in spring? Well, it's not that difficult, especially if you have guys that are following Jan and uh, our guys, uh, Roberto Perez and uh, Brett Hayes, Adam Moore, those guys that came in, Tony Walters, they came in uh, and ready, ready to go, and uh, they came in ready to, to get better. Are you ready to get out of here or you can get back to the cold of Cleveland? Yeah, I hope April was yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate it, Sandy. Thank you. All right, back to you, Matt. Thanks, uh, yeah, uh, Andre. I think Sandy speaks for all of us. I wish April yeah, was yesterday. Yeah, that's true. Everybody's kind of raring and ready to go now. You've had your, your fill of exhibition games. You've done the work, and I think everybody's just kind of ready. You know, how lucky is the tribe uh, able to get Jan Gomes in that deal, you know, from Toronto? That they didn't have a spot for him and they didn't see anything in it. And boy, oh boy, I'll tell you what, what a treat. Well, and I'll, I'll only say it because Terry Francona has said it. A big reason for that was Kevin Cash, who knew him from being in Toronto and said, hey, I think this guy could probably be a catcher. Yeah. You're never 100 percent sure, but it was it was Cash who but said you have to I get think... people to buy into it. Yeah. Yep. You know, and, and you have to have faith in the guy you're talking about that if you do trade for him, that he comes over and he's everything you thought he was. And he's turned out to be that probably better than anybody would have but a, anticipated. What a deal. What a great deal of scouts, everybody involved. Yes, it's a, it's a huge deal. But, you know, again, every club has decisions like that. It happens to every club where, you know, the guy gets a chance somewhere else and he just flourishes. Now, this is going to be Gomes' second full season, so he's going to have to go and make adjustments because the league will make adjustments to him. But I'll tell you what, he's been fun to watch for the first year, and he really grew by leaps and bounds last year. So you expect to see it more so this year. I think he's going to be in the middle part of that lineup with Moss and Santana and him. It's going to be fun because the, the, they can drive him in. And what a resource to be able to walk 20 feet from home plate and talk to a guy who was an all star catcher yeah. and played in a World Series like Sandy Alomar. I mean, well, Sandy's worked with them all. He tried to, you know, make Santana catcher, just never panned out. Santana wasn't, couldn't catch. Well, you know, there's that old saying about the tools of ignorance and anybody who's been a catcher, especially at the big league level, bristles at that notion because you, you can't just stick anybody behind home plate and oh. expect them to be a catcher. <laughs> it doesn't work that it way. Takes a certain breed of people. Nice Got him looking. Phillips rung up. Second time he struck out today. He tried to deke him and get that call. Atch comes in and just nails the outside corner when you have to. There you see it. It's framed by Gomes. Atchison last year appeared in 70 games. We've talked about this. Boy, what a nice times. year. He's, he's got such a great ability. You know, like we've talked how TJ House from the left side of the plate can throw pitches for strikes. Yeah. Atchison doesn't have the array of pitches, but boy, he's, he's got, got some the kind feel. of accuracy. Yeah, Pops has got the feel. One ball, one strike to Devin Mezzarocco, who homered to left back in the second. Wasn't it the, this the first time in his life, was he 37 years old, that he had a contract before he came to spring training? Then he after last year. That just reminds me as Mezzarocco singles in the left field. I think we're, if it's not today, it's a couple of days. With the 26th. Oh. 29th, whose birthday? Atchison will be 39. So we're three days shy of Scott's 39th birthday. Thought maybe it was today, but we're just well, we'll we're gonna miss him. it. We'll wish him a happy birthday now. Yeah, we'll give them and hope it's we'll windy so we can get all those candles blown out. <laughs> <laughs> Serve the cake outside. Actually, that was Rick that said that. I'm key. Hey, <laughs> it's all in fun. I'm believe me, I'm twice as old, so don't worry about it. Ground ball. You're almost 80? Yes. <laughs> Second for one to double play. Ends the inning. The old man turns two behind him. And we head to the bottom of the fifth, 7 1 Cincinnati.
Seven one Cincinnati as we go to the bottom of the fifth. Pitchers not working in today's game excused for the rest of the afternoon. Jose Ramirez fouled out his only time up in the second. Had some struggles early in camp with the bat but he went to the minor league games and got a number of at bats started to see some more pitches. Starting to feel like his swings coming around sends a high fly ball to center. Pretty well hit but Billy Hamilton runs it down on the track one down. Michael Bourne two for two already here today last time up. Wanted to try and bunt ball. That was a bad attempt but it was a strike. Missed on that one, so it's 2 1. Inside, now you get the count in your favor. You end up getting a pitch to your liking. And he wanted, he's been trying to work on bunting. I'm, I know it. I see it. And that was ended up being a really good at bat. He may try and bunt here just to get one down. Who knows? But boy, when he's swinging the bat well, if he could drop down a bunt every now and then, if you can get a bunt a week, you know how many hits that is? A bunt a week? Be like 20 30 hits. Extra hits. Yeah. <laughs> I think the boys in the truck are ready to start the season, too. Yeah, what are they giving you grief about? Oh, just about everything. <laughs> They're in mid season form. Well, once again, Michael Bourne seeing a lot of pitches. One ball, two strikes. If you're going home with him tomorrow, watch out. I think they have belly fever. Two and two. That pitch missed badly in terms of where Mezzarocco wanted it. And here's Bourne back in the count, two and two. Slap foul out of play. Seven runs on eight hits for Cincinnati. Just one run, four hits so far for Cleveland. And Bourne has two of those four hits. Low tantalizing off speed pitch just off the plate and born able to lay off and it's the 3 2 count now. Pops it to left and Dominguez. Will make the catch two down. Well, grab some friends and catch a game at the new two story bar progressive field with our $13 district ticket. It's presented by Sports Time Ohio at the new bar. It is the best place in town to grab a cold one. And with the district ticket, your first drink is on us. Matt's going to buy it. If he doesn't, I will. You're all taken care of. Visit Indians.com district ticket and check out the details. Nice little. Well, let's hope they need cold like ones yeah. early, you know? <laughs> Or you can get a hot, <laughs> hot one, hot toddy. We don't care. It's on us. Swing and a miss. Yeah, you could do a what a flaming 151 or something. <laughs> whatever, whatever it takes. Outside corner. Kipnis admiring, didn't like it. Called a strike. He's down on the count. Call goes Kipnis's way, and we've got a full count. Bounce 
Puts the first behind the bag. Votto had trouble with it. And he's still able to recover. The Indians go one, two, three. After five, it's seven one Cincinnati. Well, 20 game season ticket packages in the newly renovated right field district start below $20 per game. Take in all that's new, including Melt, Barrio, Great Lakes, and more. Plus, to uh, get a view of the field. Then I'm looking forward to seeing it. You've been in there this winter. I haven't, so come on out and take a look. Michael Martinez taking over at second base as the Indians implement some defensive changes off the glove of Atchison to third. Fairhand grab and throw. Not in time. Nice effort by Lonnie Chisholm. That was almost a spectacular play right there. As it is, Dominguez is aboard to start at the bottom of the sixth or the top of the sixth for Cincinnati. Well, we're joined now here in the booth by Indians general manager Chris Antonetti. Becoming a regular up here now, huh? I know. Just like every other day. You've got the matching blue on yeah, and everything. Here we, here we well, go. Well, we're coming down the stretch here. Roster decisions, many of which already appear to be made, but there are still some some uh, variables, some some fluid situations, if you will. Um, with regards to the starting pitching rotation, do you feel like you've got a lot of tough decisions to make as we come down to the end here. Yeah that's one of the few places where we do have some decisions still to make uh, in the rotation and the last couple spots in the bullpen as well as maybe the last spot in the bench. A tough day for Salazar. Yeah, it was he was uh, behind in a lot of counts and up in the zone again with his fastball so I know it's something he's been working hard on to get the ball down. He's done a good job of it in his bullpens. He's just had a difficult time translating consistently in the game. Sometimes it takes a while for young pitchers to just consistently do that I mean I, I don't know how you say it but you watch them and it seems like it, some one year they can they get better and better and better I don't know what it takes for a pitcher to go off or the light for, to go off to believe that well a couple things first and foremost he's got to make sure that his mechanics are in place to be able to get the ball and leverage it down in the zone which Danny's done a better job with but it's still probably not quite as consistent as it can be and the other is the mindset and the approach with it and be able to translate um, the work that he does in the bullpen at 90% intensity and be able to translate it on a game mount at 100% intensity. I did see today he made a couple of good pitches on the outside part of the plate, and then the next pitch he tried to add a little bit more to it. And exactly. you, know, you just yeah, you, you left get the ball off. up a little right. bit, and that, those are the balls that were hit harder. Danny's got plenty of stuff, obviously, to have, a, have success in the major leagues. He just needs to make sure he's locating his fastball down and then uh, you know, using his secondary stuff effectively. With regards to when you have to make the ultimate decision who's in who's out who's going to be on the 25 man roster etc. How much of that Chris do you feel like has to be a consensus decision with your guys with the coaching staff and everybody being on the same page so to speak. 
That's ideal. Uh, the more consensus you reach on a decision and the more aligned you are usually makes you feel more confident about it being the right decision. But, um, you know, we recognize we're not going to have unanimous decisions all the time. So in the end, Tito and I will get together with the coaching staff, take their input, gather their input, gather the input of you know, members of our front office and our scouting staff, and then, you know, make the decision we think is best for the team. Yeah, I mean, is it if it comes down to half the room's one way, half the room's the other, who casts the deciding vote? Is that you or is it Terry? I mean, how do you? Tito and I, I mean, I can't think of a decision. There aren't very many decisions over the course of the last three years that after the amount of discussion and debate and dialogue we have that we haven't arrived in a similar place. Yeah, you guys meet in the morning, you meet in the afternoon, you're in constant <laughs> touch. So all, I mean, all the time, yeah. We, <laughs> talk, we talk all the That's time. That's a marriage, man. Exactly. You get into spring training, you know everything that you're thinking and he's thinking. I, I mean, it's, I shouldn't. I probably shouldn't say this on the air, but I talk to Tito far more than I talk to my wife. Well, I, I understand that. I, Sorry, she understands Sarah, that. No, no, she understands that too in a good way. <laughs> Well, and I, and I think we've talked about it a lot. I think one of the things that makes Tito a very exceptional manager is the fact that, like with Francisco Lindor, he said, look, I talked to him at the beginning of camp. I told him you will start in the minor leagues this year. Yeah, we, So that kind of open dialogue, the honesty, that doesn't happen by accident. Yeah, one of the things we, we really try to do with every guy in camp is be as honest and upfront as we can and establish lines of communication really from the outset of camp. It's one of the purposes behind having those individual player meetings at the start of camp. Then we have individual meet meetings with players as they're as we make decisions and they're re either reassigned to the minor leagues or we inform them they're not going to make the major league team. And then once guys go back to the minor league side, there's another set of meetings just to make sure that we're completely aligned with our major league staff, our major league thoughts, as well as our minor league staff. And uh, so everyone's on the same page. The communication level is unbelievable, and that's one thing. Tito and, and you, you guys do together. It is. It's it's unbelievable. It wasn't around years ago, but now these guys know exactly what you expect, what they have to work on, what you're looking for at every level. Yeah, so the way we look at it is playing baseball is like extremely difficult and really hard to do. And it's hard enough to do when your mind's at peace and you're not wondering about things. So we try to take it and say, hey, you know what? Let's give them as much. Let's give players clarity as to what we're thinking and what's going on. So when they see Tito or me, they're not wondering, Hey, what are yeah. those guys thinking about? What are they wanting? Am I on the team? Am I not? Am I working on the right things? Am I not? And so hopefully it allows them just to have a comfort level to go out and, you know, work on getting better and performing. And they do. And I'll tell you, when I was playing, if I saw a general manager in the clubhouse, I was worried. Like someone was going <laughs> right. to get traded and you're gone. You didn't want to see right. a GM. But, right. I mean, nowadays it's so different. These guys know. So it ho hopefully it makes it easier for them at home, right? you know, and everything and their whole family, and they know what to do. And our job as an organization is to try to support them and provide them every resource possible. So hopefully, you know, the more comfortable they are, the more likely, ooh, the more likely they might be to, you know, ask for help when they need it, whether that's something on the field, whether it's something, you know, at home or, you know, even helping their wives find a doctor for, you know, their kids. The so, resources are there for them. Now, yeah. whatever they need, they, they have. Yeah. Chris, when it comes down to the final decisions, how much of that will come down to how you want the final composition of the roster to be? Whether it's, do you go with four starters to start the year because of the number yeah. of off days? Do you add an extra position player to compensate or an extra bullpen guy? Those are all, all of those things will be considerations. As everything's well. on the table. Yeah, everything's <laughs> on the table. So, I mean, it's one of the things we've tried to do over the last couple of years, too, and you guys have seen it with some of the roster decisions we've made and what our roster composition has been. You know, it really depends upon what situates us best to win that series of games. And if you do that over the course of the season, and you have to be very honest with players and explaining what we're trying to do because sometimes it necessitates maybe an option to the minor league and recalling a guy 10 or 11 days later when you don't need, you know, a starting pitcher for a stretch. But we'll try to do everything we can to, to maximize all those roster spots that we have. Yeah. You got one, Matt? Well, I was going to ask Chris because I don't know if he's a guy that has a chance to make the club out of spring training for a potential extra guy on the bench because, again, I'm not sure how many position players you're going to carry. But Michael Martinez at second base just came in the ball game. Every time I've seen a ground ball hit in his general direction, he gobbles it up. Yesterday made a terrific short hop pick through a guy out at home plate. Yeah. He's an interesting player. Not a star, not a guy people are probably aware of, unless you saw him play with the Pirates maybe, but 
where does he fit in the big picture of the organization right now? He's one of those guys. I mean, we made a series of cuts today, and he's he's one of the guys still in camp, still competing for a spot on the roster because, you know, the, the things you accentuated, he does very well. He's a really good, reliable defensive player, has versatility, can play a variety of positions, understands the game, has got good baseball instincts, good baseball IQ. So there's a spot for him on a major league team. But now what our final roster composition will look like will have a big impact on whether or not he's a guy we break. The thing I like about it now is when even though let's say they don't make this team they realize that they have things to work on and they're ready and if they do they're going to be called up in a matter of time and, and when they do they're going to have a chance to impact the team or at least help the team and that, that's the fun thing that these kids understand now. Here's a couple of looks at Michael Martinez that we've seen already this spring he's got that buggy whip arm. And pretty good. Oh, yeah, he made that, that play last time we were on television. It's a nice play. You know, it's fun when you see guys make great plays consistently defensively. I mean, it's fun to watch. No question. Right now, Brian Shaw facing Yvonne De Jesus Jr. I beg your pardon. We've got Billy Hamilton. We've already gone up to the top of the order. With one out here in the sixth. Arch, piggybacking on your point there, I think that's one of the things we talk about with guys, you know, whether it's the beginning camp or the end. Our opening day isn't going to be the final roster for right. the duration of the season. There are a lot of changes. We are going to need 35, 38, 40 players to impact our major league team over the course of the season. So there are going to be opportunities for guys to come up and contribute. Now, they're part of the responsibility is to go down and make sure that they're working on the things. So when that opportunity is there, they're ready to come up and not only just come up to the major leagues, but contribute to a winning environment. Yeah, and the funny thing is, when you watch them come up the first time, they're sort of a little leery at the big league level. But then after they go back down, they get it. And all of a sudden, they're ready to come up, and they're not as intimidated anymore, and they're ready to do whatever is asked. That was Jose Ramirez last year. The first right. time he came up, you know, maybe offensively was a little unsettled, wasn't sure his place, and um, maybe I'm not intimidated with Jose is not the right word, but just trying to feel his way. And then when he but came back, the, yeah, when he came back the second time, he was a much different player and, and much Tito, more confident at, player. At that point in time, really hadn't had a chance to see him play short a whole lot. Right. Yep. And it, it, he said, he said, well, I don't know if this guy can play short or he can, but he found out in a hurry he can. He, he can. He's he's really done a good job. Jose deserves a lot of credit where he got most of his opportunities in the minor leagues at second base. When we gave him the opportunity to go over and play shortstop, he took it and ran with it. And uh, he's a really good baseball player with good IQ and uh, may not get his fair share of credit. Well, he's not because he's young, but he will if you keep playing the, the way he does. And as a player, the one thing you have to do when that door cracks open a little bit, you right. got to jump through it. You can't let it close on you because that opportunity may not come back again. So some guys can do it and some guys feel the pressure and they can't. Well, one of the things we really try to emphasize with our guys is you can't control when that opportunity is going to be there. But you certainly can control how prepared you are for when that opportunity arrives. And the thing you don't want to have happen is when that opportunity presents itself, you're not the guy that's prepared himself to take advantage. You're not ready for it. You better be. You have to be excited with, with where Brandon Moss is at right now because I'm sure two months ago you weren't 100% sure in your mind if he'd be ready to go by the end of spring training camp and he looks raring and ready to go. Yeah, that's been one of the highlights of our spring, Matt. I think, you know, when we traded for him at the time, we were hopeful that he'd be 100% and or close to 100% and ready to go for opening day. But uh, to see the way he's sped through the rehab process and uh, the way he's returned, not only just to be healthy, but really strong and mo mobile and moving around pretty well, it's been really good to see this spring because as we've seen, he can really impact a lineup. Well, you've been down here a long time. You're probably sick of talking to us, but are you ready for the season to start? <laughs> I'm, you I'm have ready, to be. Yeah. We have some things to work through, but I'm definitely ready for the season. To I'm start. ready for games to start counting. You know, Me let too. that bell ring because the intensity level moves up then. Yeah, I think most of the players feel the same way. The only guys that may don't maybe don't feel that same way. The guys are still trying to figure out, am I on the team or am I going to Columbus or where where am I going to be in 10 days from now? Right. We still have we have we still have some work to do now. Do you have a, a set date in your mind? I want these decisions to be made by the general rule is as soon as possible. I think we try to I mean we try to put ourselves in the players you know shoes and really understand the anxiety that they might have or just the uncertainty about hey am I going to be in the big leagues? Am I going to be in AAA? When am, when am I going to know whether I'm going myself and my family we're going to Columbus or yeah. Cleveland? So as soon as we can. Thanks for stopping by. We appreciate your time as always. My pleasure, guys. Thank you. Tribe General Manager Chris Antonetti. And it's a 7-1 Cincinnati lead.
multiple changes for Cincinnati as we go to the bottom of the sixth. Marquez Smith takes over first base. Luis Gonzalez is at second base. David Murphy takes a strike. He's 0 for 2. Irving Falou is now at third. Swung out and missed. So still some decisions to be made, yeah. I guess. You know, Chris didn't sound like you know they're pretty close to being done. They, like he said, there's about three, possibly four. Murphy bangs one back through the box. His first hit of the afternoon. Just a fifth hit for Cleveland, and the Indians have their leadoff man aboard here in the sixth. I think it's important to note as Jesus Aguilar will come on and run for Murphy now. That. Okay, you can look at it one or two ways. As Chris and Terry have been consistent in saying, we want to make the decisions as soon as possible so that everybody knows where they're going and we're not taking this right down to the wire. So right. everybody's pretty much had their last go round. So they could possibly make these decisions in the next couple of days and say, look, this is what we're thinking, this is where we're going to go. Because if they wait for these starters to go back one time yeah, again through. It'll be right before you break. Right. It'll be another so week. We might have a decision. Coming and, and and well, you know, like he said, what's the hurry? I mean, you're going to have your team ready to go for the fifth. Easy double play ball, two down. And a lot of it will depend on how they want that final roster to look. You know, right now, and you're looking at it because we open up with Houston and then we break into our own division. Full of games. We play Detroit and then Chicago, and then we go out what to Minnesota, Chicago, Detroit. So uh, that wouldn't surprise me to break out with maybe four starters and see what happens. With the case of using a McAllister as a spot starter, and then if he's not going to start, he can use him out of the bullpen. That would make sense to me, and I'm sure they've kicked that tire. Well, I'm sure they've looked at every possible oh, yeah, that, scenario right. and. There's and no doubt. what's the best one. What's how, and that, how do you get to a consensus on that? Because you know, the thing of it is, if you if you go with four, you can always keep that guy number five that you may want right here and start them on uh, on regular rotations and with the team the way the keep them in good year, in other words, extended spring here training. or you, you pitch him, yes, or anytime he has an opportunity to pitch, go to the minor leagues and pitch in the game there. Uh huh. Well, they'll uh, they'll figure it all out and get it sorted. Yeah, right now you, you come back and you say, let's just let's get out of here help the rest of the way. Brandon Moss with a solid line drive single in the right field is aboard with two down here in the sixth inning. Well, here's one. I don't care if you played the ship. You'd have to have four on the right side if you wanted to catch this one. Puts a good swing on, lines it into right field for a base hit. Gonna get a pinch runner for Brandon Moss. One of the guys that's up here from the minor leagues today that gets his opportunity. That's David Armanderes. And a fastball strike to Jan Gomes. Cuts and misses, and it's quickly 0 and 2. is aboard two on with two out here in the six during the regular season that's something you would probably expect if you, one team gets a couple of guys hit by a pitch there's always a chance that one of your guys is going to get plunked as well and then there are some managers who might even carry that into a spring training game as well 
Lonnie Chisholm all 0 for 2. And a pitch is over the outside corner for a strike. had a tough day. He was robbed of extra bases in the second inning on a spectacular diving catch by Billy Hamilton in center field. Then fourth inning he had a line drive that was caught by the shortstop. So on a normal day he might be two for two but today he's got to hang with him. Okay. Mahal, he thought he both breaking balls uh, out of the last three pitches he thought hit. One was inside, one was away, and he's walking off the mound. Where was that pitch? You want to talk about down the middle? Are you serious? <laughs> we, remember the last game we did it, we couldn't get the game to end because he wouldn't call a strike. It was I, I mean, I really don't know how you can't call that one a strike. Well, that all ends it. No runs, two hits, Indians leave two. We go to the seventh, 7-1 seven Reds. All right, all kinds of changes now. This is definitely one of those games where you need a program. Brett Hayes has taken over behind the plate. Jerry Sands is now at first base. Ryan Rollinger has taken over for Lonnie Chisnall at third. There's Armanderas who came in to pinch run. He's in right. Get the rest of them here in a moment. Josh McAdams is in left field. <laughs> Brandon Phillips. DHing today, so still in the ball game. 0 for 3 has struck out twice. That was a good looking pitch. And Brian Shaw is left to wonder.
High pop. Slicing out a plate on the right side. Three two popped him up back out of play. Okay. As fans are aware of or maybe not aware we have Andre not part of our team this year he'll be with us every game reporting from on the field and in the clubhouse before and after the ball game. So Andre I know you you spent a lot of time on NFL sidelines watching the, the game at that level. From the ground level. Yes. Now you're subterranean level watching a big league ball game. How about the view from down there? The view the is perspective. Yeah, it's unbelievable. I've been to a lot of big league games, but never this close. And I can tell you in football, the first time I did an NFL game, I'll never forget my dad called me afterwards. He goes, If you don't move, you're gonna get killed. <laughs> well, if you don't watch every pitch down here, I'm gonna get killed. <laughs> it's about the same thing. The speed and the, the accuracy and the, the rate, the how hard the ball is going around, it's unbelievable watching it from well, down here. It really is. You did an interview with Sandy Alomar, you might be want to ask him for a face mask and shit guns. I think he'd be happy to give you some. That might not be the only part of equipment I might ask for. I'll lend you a cup. Don't you worry. I got a little plastic one up there. I'm going to be done with after today. I will talk about that one off the air. About that. But it, it, it actually is. It gives you a greater respect for what these guys do out here on this field when you're this close and seeing uh, whether it's the pitchers, whether it's just a shortstop throwing the ball from short to first. It is amazing to watch just the difference from sitting up there where you guys are to being down here. Well, and Andre, the, the the thing that I've always found fascinating about Major League Baseball is that Buddy Bell once told me that of all the professional sports, when the ball is put in play, baseball is the fastest game of all of them. Wow. That's a good point. That's a great point. You know, the other thing about Big League Baseball, and you guys know this, is these guys make it look easy. Oh, yeah. You know, when you sit up there or you watch on television or whatever, it looks like, ah, he hit the ball 300 feet. Well, that's a pretty nice shot, even though it's caught by the left fielder or center fielder. These guys make the game look easy, and it's not. Well, the, the farther you get away from between the lines, the easier it gets. And that's what players will tell you. Boy, you get into the trenches, and it is. Uh, it's a lot quicker than people realize. Absolutely. The other thing I picked up on uh, early on is how much these, these guys talk about their at-bats and about different things that they see. Uh, it was interesting earlier in the game to watch Chisholm go back and forth with some of the left-handed him and Bourne were going back and forth about what they saw from the pitchers. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that'll go on throughout the year, but it's just interesting because they can, you know, as both two left-handed hitters, they were talking about what they saw and what they didn't see. Just little things like that jump out to you right away. Ground ball to short, and a tribe will turn two. Well, those are some of the things that we'll look to glean from you during the season. They'll be down there and snuggled up to the tribe all season long, and Andre Knott will do a great job for us. All year long Cincinnati on top seven to one and after that double play Terry Franco is going to go to the mound and do what he does extremely well <laughs> make, make a, a pitching, pitching change <laughs> <laughs> time out in Goodyear with the Indians down a half dozen. I'm outside where are you.
<laughs> no, Brian Shaw, his day is done. This takes a seat on the bench. And now Jeff Manship will take over with two down. And the base is empty here in the seventh. Low and away, ball one. Hot smash in the right field. Bosch beats the infielders who were shifted around. Second hit of the day. Chris Dominguez, who has two hits and has scored a run, will be the batter now. High chopper to third. It's a foul ball. And as Rollinger went over into foul ground to track it down. It's almost like that ball hit off turf as high as it went up. Well, and as you said, the, the dirt, it might look great when the game starts, but about four innings in, it's it rock hard. Well, again. yeah, it turns to become hard because the sun, and, you know, it's been almost 90 degrees here for a couple of weeks, so that, it's a hard infield. Ball scoot through it. It's been over a week since we last had rain of any kind. You know, we get out here and, and you watch it, but at 10 10 30, they're watering the whole field down mm -hmm. out here in the grass, the, the, you know, the warning tracks, the infield. Foul back to the screen. Dominguez hanging in there. Down 0 2. Down low. High pot center field. In comes Holt. And the inning is over. Stretch time in Goodyear. It's the Red Seven, the Indians one.
Linux Children's offer a uh, the premier learning experience for baseball players in Northeast Ohio. You can sign up today. Let the professionals teach your child the Indians way to play the game. Go to Indians.com. JJ Hoover on the pitch now for Cincinnati. Last year in 54 games took his lumps with 10 losses. And he'll be facing. The eight nine and leadoff spots in the Indians order. That number eight spot is now manned by Josh McAdams. First ball swing fouls and out of play. McAdams last year. Former seventh round pick in 12. Oh, in a way. One of them on the count. Ways at the off speed pitch down now in the count. One ball and two strikes. Adams out of Calhoun, Georgia, was a seventh round pick three years ago. Strike three called, one away. The girls' high school state championship games this past Saturday were great games, and the boys promised to bring you the same excitement. Join us for all four division state title games this Saturday starting at 1030 a.m. on Sports Time Ohio. Jose Ramirez looks at a breaking ball outside. One and one to count. For two today for Ramirez. They had an opportunity to send Ramirez down to play in a minor league game to get some at bats and feel a little more comfortable at the plate where he's seeing more pitches. Oh, they're good breaking ball. Out of play. Another foul right back. Just over forty one hundred. Here today in Goodyear for this Indians Reds matchup. The 2 2 in the air to center. Two down. Top of the order and Tyler Holt who came on for Michael Bourne. Bourne, one of the highlights today for the Indians. Two for three out of the leadoff spot with a single, a double, and a run scored. He's had a very good spring. He sure has. He's been fun to watch. Let's see, Arch, that gives him uh, 16 hits and 40 at bats. He's probably saying, let's go now yeah. because, you know, Houston, his hometown, where he grew up. So he'll be going home to open the season. Just like you said, the way he's uh, working the count and tracking the ball right now, you can tell he's in a pretty good frame of mind. Yeah, he sure looks like it. Trying to go 
Hold up. Yes. He did not go around. He was able to hold the back back. Hoover has a, a very good breaking ball as he, sh he has showed this inning. It's a matter of laying off it and locating his fastball. He lays off that breaking ball. It's a full count. The Indians will get the Reds two weekends this year. Get back to normal where we when we started interleague play. Low ball four, two out walk keeps the inning alive. And here's Michael Martinez. The Reds will come to Cleveland on May 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. And then the Indians will head to Cincinnati right after the All-Star break. And that's where the All-Star game is going to be this year is in Cincinnati. So we'll open it up right after the break. Little jam job slowly rolled to second base. Inning over. We'll go to the eighth. 7-1 Cincinnati. The telecast is presented by authority of the Cleveland Indians and may not be reproduced or retransmitted in any form. And the accounts and descriptions of this game may not be disseminated without the express written consent of the Cleveland Indians. All right. Another beautiful day here in Goodyear. Cincinnati having most of the fun, though, here with a 7-1 lead. Yeah, happened early and often. One in the first, four in the second, and two in the fourth. Toru Mirata will get the uh, ball now for Cleveland. And Austin Fisher is now in the ball game at shortstop, so that takes care of all of the original starters now. Over the outside corner for a strike. Swung on and missed. Mirata was born in Osaka, Japan. He 
pitched uh, three years professionally in the Japanese minor leagues starting in 2008 and then came to the Indians when he was signed in 2011. He gave you his career numbers a moment ago. He was pitched in Kinston, Akron, Columbus. Kind of one of those guys who's he's shown promise but is just never really been able to get over the proverbial hump. As evidenced by his record career of 22 wins, 20 losses, ERA 4.09. So there's been some good, but there's been some rocky spots as well. Last year in particular, at Double A Akron, he was five and four with a 4.61 ERA. At Triple A Columbus, five and three with a 5.38 ERA. Hit high in the air, deep left center field. Holt back on the track, and it is off the wall. And Luis Gonzalez is in the second base with a one-out double. Yeah, you get that fastball up, and then he gave it a ride to base of the wall in left center field. No siree, he wasn't going to get inside there. Gonzalez with a good swing. Holt played it nicely off the base of the wall. It's a double. One out double. It looks like they want Hamilton to play nine today, huh? One of the few remaining yeah. in the ball game. Murata delivers and Hamilton gets it right back to him. Murata has the runner held up. He did a terrific job. Gives it up. Just run it all the way back. There you and go. they tag him up. Boy, that was well played by Murata to get the out two down. Yeah, instead of throwing the baseball, he, he make the runner commit. And that's exactly what he did. He knew he wasn't going to get back there, so he made him commit. He starts to third base. Now give it up to the third baseman, run him all the way back to second, and that way you can keep the speedster Hamilton at first. Where you know he's not in scoring position, so that rundown was done very well. Like so many of the Japanese pitchers we have seen come to Major League Baseball over the years, Murata well schooled on the fundamentals, as well as you don't see it here out of the stretch, but when he's in the windup, he's got that little pause right at the top of his delivery. Missed outside. Two balls and two strikes. Hit hard and fair down the left field line. That'll go all the way down into the corner. That's going to enable the speedster Hamilton to easily score. And Marquez Smith with the two out RBI double makes it 8 1 Reds. Well, he gets himself a hanging breaking ball and he knew exactly what to do with it. He really with two strikes quick and it was just a, a, a flat slider. And he hammered it down the line very quick. And no question you're going to score that guy. That's just a jog in the park for him on the bases. 
He comes around, scores Cincinnati's eighth run of the afternoon, the first one that the bullpen has allowed up for the Tribe. There's Irving Falou. Pitch low. Chopped right up the middle and through. Marquez Smith comes around. Nine one Reds. Third hit in the inning allowed by Murata. He had two outs, bases empty. Well, two outs with a runner at first. And now back to back RBI hits. They have allowed Cincinnati to open it up. Brandon Phillips, 0 oh, for. One for four now on the day. Scorecard's pretty much a disaster right uh, now. That's okay. You can burn it when you leave here. <laughs> Looks like one of my fourth grade homework homework projects. <laughs> He hit that twice. But it only counts for one strike and it's 0 and 2. There's a foul there and a foul there. Yeah, good follow through. Bounced through the Indians left side of the infield. Rollinger dove for it at third. He didn't get it. Fisher was there to back it up and it went right through his wickets as well. Yeah, I, I don't know if he was screened at all by Rollinger, but the, you know, that's a play that he was over there and it looked like it went between his legs. Not sure. There's a ball. He's ready for it. I don't think Rollinger touched it. Do you? No. I, it didn't look like a deflection to me. But I think he might have screened him, as you pointed out, just enough. Well, there you go. Now he's looking for the ball, and it just got up on him so quickly that uh, he didn't make a play. So two in a row. Fisher's, uh, you know, had a plays that looked like he could have made them. Devin Mazzarocco still in there for Cincinnati. He's got two hits, including a solo home run. And that's plugged a deep center hole running into the gap. Takes the hit away. Two, run, uh, two runs in for the Reds here in the eighth, and it's now 9-1 Cincinnati.
Nine one Cincinnati. As we roll on to the bottom of the eighth inning. New pitcher for Cincinnati. Nate Adcock last year with the Texas Rangers appearing in just seven games in the area of four and a half. He'll be on here to face the three four five spots for Cleveland. Jesus Aguilar going to lead it off then Jerry Sands. And a pitch is low, ball one. We've seen Edcock in uh, in the past pitching for Kansas City. Guy who could make a couple of spot starts here and there, but primarily is pitched out of the bullpen. In 2013, though, he spent the entire year in AAA. Ties up Aguilar. And the count is two and one. Jesus Aguilar this spring has been a different guy than the one we saw a year ago. He's batted 375. Aaron Francona feels like he just guy who feels a, a little more comfortable. He said last year he was very respectful, but he was very quiet. Never really came out of his shell. And he said that's not the, the report you get on him because when he's in the minor leagues, he's the man. Everybody wants to go and talk to him when they're when they go to a Different city and play another team. All their players want to come over and talk to the big man. But he said when he was up with the Indians last year, even in big league camp, he was very quiet. Yeah. Knew his place, which is, I think, that's a smart play when you're the young guy. Yes. But Terry said, I want to see more of his personality. Now there's a swing and a miss, and that's out number one here in the bottom of the eighth inning. Let's go back down to Andre. Andre, this is an interesting guy coming to the plate now, Jerry Sands. He's 27 years old. He's, he's been around with a couple of different organizations, but uh, he's a right handed bat, which is something the tribe has been desperate to look for. And interesting to see if maybe there's a fit. Absolutely. Not only is he a right handed bat, Matt, but guys, he has some power. He hit the shot of spring probably Tuesday night where he had a 480 foot bomb to center field uh, on Tuesday night. And the thing is, as you said, he hits from the right hand side. He's got some major league experience. He probably won't leave here with the ball club. But, you know, this is one of those guys, you know, Arch, you talked about it throughout the, the, the afternoon. This is a guy that you may see with the Indians come May, come June, July, that maybe can give this team some right-handed pop, can play first base, can play outfield. Uh, just a fun guy to watch so far this spring. Two doubles, two home runs already so far. Yeah, I think he has opened some eyes. And, and, and they realize that, you know, he's in his mid to, to upper 20s. But he's a right-handed bat, and he's had a pretty good spring. But, again, he falls into that category, first baseman, outfielder, DH. And the Indians have enough of those guys right now. So that's probably, uh, you know, blocking his way. But I'll tell you what, being a right-handed bat and, and showing some pops certainly helps. 0-2 pitch. Well, he's had a couple of years, and granted, it was in the minor leagues. And granted, it was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, where the ball tends to travel a little bit. 29 homers, 26 homers, 107 ribbies, 88 ribbies. So, you see, yeah, I mean that's that's still a good year no matter where you play. Yeah, you know, it's funny with, with guys that never get an opportunity. The key is you have to stay on the field and prove it year after year after year, and you probably wouldn't bounce around as much. But one of those guys that probably doesn't have one position. You know, you have to go out to a, and play a couple of different positions nowadays, especially if you're going to play on a team like the Indians. But the positions he's looking to play, uh, there's a log jam. Swung on and missed. Back to back strikeouts for Adcock here in the eighth inning, and there are two down. David Amandares will get an at bat here 
with two down. Bouncer to short, scooped up, and the Indians go one, two, three. We'll go to the ninth, nine, one, Reds. Forward to opening day in Houston. Sweet 16 tips off tonight in Cleveland. He'll be uh, rapping about that as well. That's right. About that, huh? That's right. That's a that's a nice weekend to have there. Get down to the final four this weekend. Wow. Thanks. Yeah, it's coming quickly. That opening day in the big leagues. Here's Grant Sides last year. And a ball with the Carolina ball club went uh, four and two with a 267 ERA out of the pen with 43 games under his belt. It's an opportunity for a lot of these young guys to a pitching a big league spring training game in the stadium. Also, more importantly, an opportunity to them for them to perform in front of the big league skipper and coaching staff. And it's it's funny. It's, it's always been interesting to me that you think about when you're a young kid, you're just out there flying around 100 miles an hour. The world's spinning fast and you're just trying to survive. Right. But what the manager, what the coaches uh, and what the front office guys what they're looking for is they're not going to look at your stat line. They're watching for how do you handle the moment? How do you handle yourself? Uh, are you a spoiled brat out there? Are you kicking the dirt, throwing your helmet? Are you a pro? I mean, they're they're looking for so many things that when you're 18, 19, 20 years old, you're not even thinking about probably. Well, the intangibles and it's not letting the game speed up on you. It's where how, how can you slow it down? You know. And believe me, you can spot that with kids. Are they nervous? How they handle the situation? How they attack? If you're a pitcher, do you throw strikes and just go out there and be aggressive and don't you don't care who you're facing? Hey, it's a big deal for these kids to get an opportunity to come in and pitch at the big league level. I don't care if it's a spring training game or not because it's a dream come true. Something you've dreamed about your whole life. Fouled right back by Bosch, who's a big league hitter without a doubt. He's had a lot of time. At the major league level, and he can swing it. He's two for four on the day with a run scored. So for Grant Sides, big opportunity. He's a big kid at 6'4, 215 pounds out of Samford University. 12th round pick of the Indians back in 2011. Popped him up. Rollinger calling for it. 
And he's got it one away. Danny Salazar started this game for the Indians. Struck out the side in the first inning, but also gave up that home run to Todd Frazier. Things did not get better in the second inning. Surrendered a home run to Devin Mezzarocco, and then three more runs. Yeah, very inconsistent today. And, you know, instead of relaxing and then just letting his stuff play, he was all over the place. Left ball was middle of the plate, and the, the in inconsistency came out. Chris Dominguez has his third hit of the ball game. All three of them singles. And he's aboard with one out here in the ninth. Well, at the end of the day, Danny Salazar's line was three and a third innings with seven runs on six hits. Oh, we got a, an Indian and a red. Kid. Oh, oh, he squirted him. I hope that was water. <laughs> uh oh, down goes Jay Bruce. There's another red. He goes on the DL. <laughs> Holy smokes! They started at a young age, boy. The rivalry <laughs> for the Ohio Cup. There's a hit in the right field as Dominguez stops at second. And now back to back hits here in the ninth. We had the Indian drawing first blood in that one. Christopher Negron has that's his first hit of the day, but he was hit by pitches twice by Danny Salazar uh -huh. and came around to score both times earlier. Danny did not walk a batter today. He struck out six, but again, the, the two hit batters both came around to score and just. The the level of consistency see a uh, consistency that they were looking for hoping for was not there today. Sides delivers and Luis Gonzalez punches it into right field to load the bases. Three straight singles. And now we go to the top of the order and Billy Hamilton. Six that bat for Hamilton today. Yeah, he's got a couple of hits, a double, two runs scored, an RBI. He's also struck out twice. Let's go. One thing we haven't seen, especially. You know, here today is how can Hamilton impact the game with his ability to bunt and get aboard? Because with his speed, as you pointed out earlier, if you can get you know, an extra bunt hit a week, it's going to improve your overall game dramatically with the speed he has. Rockets that one to right field. Nice catch made by Armandiras. And the Reds add another run on the sack fly by Hamilton. His second RBI of the day. 10-1 Cincinnati. Well, he does though. He tries to bunt once a game. You know, we'll see. I mean, when we yeah. play against him this year, you watch. And at the end of May, he'll try and get on base at one time a day by a bunt, and he'll get the feel for it. You just think about what, you know, how how dangerous Kenny Lofton became when he. Came to the plate because of that ability to bunt. Yeah, Omar Vizquel too. I mean, yeah. when you can bunt and you can prove to teams, they have to come in at the corners, and he can run so well. Stolen base is not a problem for him. You know, when I remember when he first came up before he had a chance to play every day last year, Dusty Baker he stole about 12 or 13 bases right in a row. You know, and yeah. when they were in the thick of it to get to the playoffs. Long drive to deep left, and she is gone. Marquez Smith. Sends one out of here. It's a three run homer and a four run ninth for the Reds. I'll tell you what, Smith has come up here and just promptly lined a double down the left field line, and it's a 
three run dinger. What an afternoon for him. I mean that ball gets out in a hurry. He's had a couple of great pitches both breaking balls that he had hits on the other one was a hanger. This one was a spinner that he elevated. So he's driven in four today. It's a 13 to one game. Irving Falou tops one toward first. Sands with the flip to sides. And the inning is over. But the Reds robbing the Indians today 13 to 1. In good year. Cincinnati goes to the bullpen one last time. Pedro Villarreal will come on now for the Cincinnati Reds. He appeared in 12 games last year with a 430 ERA. Well, in a 13 to 1 ball game, there's not a lot of highlights usually for the team that only has one. But Michael Bourne was a bright spot for the Indians early on. Two hits, uh, scored a run. Really is a running well, Rick, and swinging the bat well, and seeing the ball. A couple of good catches well. out in the outfield, and mm -hmm. uh, yeah, he looks uh, he looks really ready to go. Let's put it that way. Like as as Francona said today, his legs are under him. He looks like they're they're strong again, and let's hope that that lasts because a healthy Michael Bourne could have an impact on this offense for the Indians. Yeah, last year he just never seemed to be right. And I don't know if it was just an extension from the hamstring injury at the end of the previous season that yes. lingered and carried over or what, but he put in a lot of hard work in the offseason. And at his age and with the time he has in the game, that's uh, admirable to know that he he's not just mailing it in. He, he wants he wants to still be a force in the game and, and can be. Let's face it. it you know, if you've got a dynamic base stealer, we were just talking about this the other night. Remember in 05 when the White Sox went out and got Scott Pesednik? It yeah. changed the dynamic of their club because every time he was on base, he was on he second was a base. to run. Yeah. yeah. And it's not that where Bourne has to steal every time he gets on. That's not necessarily the case. But he has to run a little bit more than he has the last couple of years because of leg problems to set the table. Brett Hayes lines a base hit in the right field. And we get a pinch runner for Hayes. And that looks like Jeremy Lucas, who's come into the ball game out of run for Brett Hayes. You're all over. You see what happens when you're down here all spring. <laughs> Murph told me it was Hank Trees. 
That's a base hit right field over near the line. Lucas on his way to third. Misplayed by Bosch. That's going to enable Rollinger to go in at second base. And Lucas is all the way to third now. He was going there anyway. Yeah, there's a swing and inside out swing. And let's see if that ball gets over near the seats. And here comes Bosch. No, he just missed it. He just flat out missed the baseball. So that'll be a single and an error. Joe Seaver. Sound like it might have broke his bat. Seaver will get the RBI. But the Reds get the out. One away. It's a 13 to 2 ball game now. So the Indians open up in Houston. Three and then right home for Detroit and Chicago. And then right Long back in the trip. division on the road. Twins, White Sox, Tigers. Yeah, so you stay in the bulkier division in the first 30 games of the season, which I guess that's the way it's supposed to be, but you better come out ready to ready and shoot. It's a 10 day road trip to three of the towns. You get to see the White Sox not only at home, we get to go to Chicago. They made quite a few additions in the off season. And you know Minnesota is going to be Minnesota. They're going to play for 27 outs and play you hard under the new manager Paul Molitor. What kind of an impact do you expect Molitor to, Molitor to have in his first year? You know I think uh, for the young kids that the twins have I think that uh, you know how can't you listen to a guy you think a Hall of Famer when he's going to tell you something the kind of player he was. And I mean they know him because he was in their minor league system. It's not like he's just coming up putting on a uniform and you know hey here it is. He, he's been around there and he knows all those kids and the Minnesota system. So it's, it's got to have an impact I would think. Well the one thing we know about the twins organization under Terry Ryan. They wouldn't have hired Paul Molitor just because he's a name. No. Pitch up high. You know, Gardenhire was there for what, 12 years? And the guy, did, he was a great manager. Uh, you know, but sometimes that voice goes uh, unheard when you've been there for so long that you have to make a change. And I said, I read somewhere, I, I think it was in this last week, that Gardenhire, he, he wants to manage again. He wants to come back. Todd Hankins strikes out, two down. You're right. It's interesting how that has changed over the years to where we we may not see you know manager last as long as say Joe Torre did in New York. Yeah, you burn out a lot quicker. Now. Tony La Russa. Yeah, yeah, because it just seems that you know whether it's the man. Look at Joe Madden. Maybe it's the manager that just maybe he has had enough of a particular organization and wants to change too. Yeah, you know, when you think about it, and you spend as much time with an organization as you do, day in and day out, in the six months of the games, 162 plus 30 spring training, it, it, you can wear on, on players, and players sometimes they they just don't listen. It's like you talking to your child. After a while, you've already told them how many times that don't do this, and they kept saying, "Yeah, right, okay, beat it." And you could say, "Well, yeah, but if you win, winning cures everything." Not not true because in a lot of those cases that guys did win. Yeah. You didn't win at all, but you, you may have had some good seasons. Indians batting here in the bottom of the ninth down. 13 to 2 Tyler Holt. At the plate.
Ground ball up the middle. Shortstop cuts it off. Negron throws him out. The ball game is over. Cincinnati beats the Indians today by a final of 13 to 2. They go to 11 and 9 on the spring. The Indians are now 10 and 13. So, given that uh, tomorrow's Friday, not a uh, you know, little over a week to go until it's time to start counting them up for real. Obviously, spring training records mean nothing. We just keep track of them for something to do. And as we've detailed throughout the telecast, Indians have some decisions to make. We expect those are going to come in the next few days with regards to the final spots in the rotation and how the, you know, the final roster composition will look. But who knows? We'll have to wait and see. Uh, yeah, you wait and see. I guarantee you they'll be ready to go come uh, April 5th in Houston on opening day. We know one thing Kluber's going to totally the rubber for yeah. the Indians and they're ready to go. So, uh, you know. Spring training is spring training. I can't wait for the bell to ring. Let's move on and let's get it started. Yeah, more than anything, Rick, you just hope now keep everybody healthy from here on out yeah. so you don't have to deal That's with any last minute injury situations. That's the main goal. Start the season fresh and healthy and uh, move on from there and let's hope that happens. We will be there to bring it to you live from Houston, Texas, when the Indians open the regular season against the Astros. We'll have a one hour special edition of Indians Live, and then we'll have it all at 7 o'clock Eastern Time, Monday, April 6th. For Rick Manning, for Andre Knott, and all of our hard work and crew and staff all spring long here in Goodyear, Arizona, I'm Matt Underwood. Thanks for watching. We'll see you on opening day.